This is Hockey Inside Out. I'm your host, Adam Susser, coming to you from the Gazette Studios in downtown Montreal. I'm here with Stu Cowan, Chris Nyland, and we have a new panelist joining us today. She's been with us in the past, but is making her Season 3 debut. Please say hello to CBC Daybreak's Jessica Rusnak. Hello! Hi! <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Let's take a look at what we're going to be talking about on today's show. Number one, does anyone in the NHL even know what goaltender interference is? Number two, how much of Carey Price's recent struggles can be attributed to Andre Markov's absence? Number three, were you surprised that Mike McCarron was made a healthy scratch in his hometown and then sent back to the AHL on Monday? Number four is our viewer question of the week, which asks, do the Canadians have a shooting coach, and if not, do they need one? And number five, is Philip Deneau good enough to be a second-line center behind Alex Galchenyuk? Let's start the show. In an attempt to deke out Carey Price on Saturday night, Rangers forward Kevin Hayes got his leg caught in Carey Price's pad, dragging the goalie five feet out of the net, leaving it practically empty for Rick Nash to score in. Listening to the game on the radio, my blind cousin Phil was able to hear the goaltender interference, yet somehow, when the NHL took a look at the replay on camera, they ruled the play fair and counted the goal. Which begs the question, does anyone in the NHL even know what goaltender interference is? Or are they just two fancy words strung together that ultimately mean nothing? What do I, you think? I don't think the players know. I think everybody's confused. I mean, if that wasn't goalie interference, I don't know what is. And what was comical, looking from the press box down at the referees, they have this little tiny iPad, and they're looking at it. I guess it wasn't working, so they, they called the tech guy over, and I was going, like, the NHL's got to have a better way of dealing with this. Yeah, the rule, I think, uh, it, there's too much gray area in there. You, 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 it's too much left to interpretation. You actually need a lawyer to read the rule and understand it. And... Um, you know, I, I just, again, it's the Canadian's goalie, and he gets pulled out of the net, and it's Carey Price, and, you know, we want that to be a penalty. Listen, I, I thought contact when I looked at the replay and stopped time, and I went to KerryFraser.com, and I actually disagreed with him. Can you believe it? <laughs> but it's the one of the first clips of it shows his foot in the crease on pot pot in the blue paint and pot on the red line and then he drags him out um of the crease so you know they they had to have seen that looking at their little tablet maybe it wasn't because they said the tech guy maybe yeah, didn't fix it but I, I just i don't know i again it's just another thing that makes the nhl look like a clown show sometimes and it's unfortunate what surprises me is that Goaltender interference has been this gray area for so long that why has the NHL not sat down and said, okay, let's go over what exactly it is and how can we get these calls to be consistent? Because right now, as we've been saying, no one knows what it is. And if you want to make the game better, this is something that you need to address. I mean, they've been crazy. I mean, remember the old toe in the crease rule yeah. they used to have at one point? <laughs> well, that's where it started from. Yeah. It started from the Brett Hall situation in Buffalo and Dallas and there was a Stanley Cup won by Dallas because of that and that's when they they wrote a novel uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> rule 69 whatever it is <laughs> to A me, B C D E F G <laughs> to me if a player makes it impossible for a goalie to make a save it's goalie interference and that's what happened on that play now, there's a lot of um, crying in the Montreal media saying that this is a Toronto bias do you think that's a factor or in this case or is it just no one really knowing, you know, what goaltender interference is. I think it's people not really knowing what goaltender interference is. Yes, it is people in a control room in Toronto reviewing the this. The war room. The war <laughs> room. The war room. Whoa. And yeah, maybe there is some bias Scary. in there that I don't think anyone coming in that works for the NHL haven't been hockey fans in the past. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's a Toronto versus Montreal thing. It's just no one having a clue what's going on. Okay. Um, Andre Markov has been injured since December 17th. In seven out of the ten games that Carey Price has played in since that date, he's allowed in three or more goals, which is a little uncharacteristic of the goalie. How much of Price's recent struggles do you think can be attributed to Andre Markov's absence? I think quite a bit. I think it's sort of a trickle-down effect because the Canadians haven't been able to find a reliable number six defenseman that Michel Terrier has faith in. So this number six defenseman is whoever it is is getting like six or seven minutes a game, which increases the workload on the other guys, which makes them get more run down. Nathan Beaulieu and Petrie had looked really good together. They're starting to look like they might be a little tired. But I think if people who didn't appreciate Andre Markov before are appreciating him a lot more now that he's gone. Cool. Uh, he's real good with a stick. Um, you know, he's, he's great on the penalty kill with a stick. He, he, he's got great presence of mind out there, uh, good positioning, but 
Um, I don't think Kerry Price misses him so much that he's getting scored on like he is. I think that's more of an issue with the entire team and the way they play down low in their own end. A lot of mistakes are made at certain times, and sometimes he covers up. Most of the time he does. Sometimes he doesn't. But if you look at his history, usually around January into February is his worst month. If you go and look since he's been here, his goals against uh, usually go up in that month. I think you could also ask Mike Komisarek how much he missed playing with Andre <laughs> Markov, where he <laughs> gave him such a great contract that he got with the Leafs there. So I do think that perhaps there is some kind of correlation with Andre Markov being out of the lineup because he's you know, such a, such a strong player for the Canadians that you do start to notice him missing a bit. Price has also looked a little weak to the stick side. Eric Stahl beat him stick side on a breakaway for a game winner. Then he did it again the next time he faced yeah. him. And I guess maybe guys around the league see that and they've been shooting more to his stick side. But, you know, Carey Price, you got to remember, he missed almost an entire season last year. And it's just a little bit of a slump I think he's been going through. But uh, um, he'll be back. Okay. Uh, Mike McCarron was not only made a healthy scratch in his hometown of Detroit, Michigan, but he was sent back to the AHL after the game. Uh, Chris, I know you spoke to Mark Bergeron recently on your show. What are your thoughts on that? Were you surprised by the move? Yeah, I, I was a little bit surprised, but really when you look at it, I watched him uh, since he came here. Uh, he Again, he came over from the wing to center, which is a, a, a huge burden and a lot to take in, a lot to learn uh, and try and make the big team in doing that. That being said, when he came in here, this year and he got called up. He played really well. He was intense. He got involved. You know, he stuck up for his teammates. He scored a goal. He was winning some faceoffs, not doing too bad. Uh, but uh, I think his play tailed off. I saw the Winnipeg game. He was giving the puck away a lot. He wasn't getting there to make the hits. Uh, and when you see that, um, it, it looks like it looked like to me he's he isn't quite ready yet. Um, and to sit here, and I agree with Bergie when he says to sit here, maybe play seven minutes a game, not play that much. I'd rather have him down there playing mm -hmm. and, and bring him back come playoff time. And I'm sure he's going to be back. It's just why sit him here and uh, let him watch? Mm -hmm. One of the things the Canadians always talk about when they have a young player is that they want to find consistency in their game. Yes, they might have a few good games and then sort of tail off a bit, but they don't want that to happen. And for young players too, confidence is such a huge issue that you don't want them to start doubting themselves. So as you said, you know, go down to the AHL, get your confidence back, get a little bit more playing time. And also Michael McCarron's not going to be a player that's going to play seven minutes a night. You want him to be more of a, a power forward kind of role. So take your time with him. He showed some promise and it's just a matter of him. It was a great interview Chris had with uh, Bergevin on his radio show and the thing that struck me a bit is <laughs> Bergevin said he didn't want him playing seven minutes a game here because he doesn't play the, he won't play the power play and he can't penalty kill. I think he should be on the power play. I think he's that big presence in front. I think if you put him out there, he's going to play more than seven minutes. Uh, they're missing that big body and I think he can play the power play and he's effective standing in front yeah, of the net. Yeah, but that's going to take time too. I, I get the getting in front of the net. That's a good thing. But you got to be able to do more than just stand in front of the net. You got to be quick in the corners. You got to be good on the cycle. You got to be able to separate guys from the puck. You have to get there. You got to be part of the breakout. I'm not saying he can't do that. I don't think he's quite there yet. Go stand in front of him, that's one thing, but there's a lot more on the power play that a player like him has to do to be a guy that's going to be relied on consistently. Well, he assisted on both ice caps goals in his first game back, so he's obviously working hard down there. And you'd like to see him on the power play now? You think he's ready in the NHL? I think he's ready. I think, I think if the Canes had another big body, I would understand more sending him down, but they don't. He's the only sort of big body they have. But you know, we'll see if it, you know, we'll see, time will tell if this is the right decision or not. Okay. At this point in the show, it's time for our HIO viewer question of the week. This week's question comes to us from Joseph Melizia, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in, Wid in Ridgeway, Ontario, who writes, The Habs' biggest problem is completely missing the net, even when they are shooting from the slot. Do the Canadians have a shooting coach, and if not, do they need one? Is there ever even such a thing as a shooting <laughs> coach, Chris? No. <laughs> no shooting coach. No, 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 no. I think, uh, it, Shooting is just practice, put the pucks out there, practice hitting the net, the corners, whatever, repetition. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some technique to it, but I, I, I don't think if you don't have that technique by now, <laughs> you're not going to be here. But, it, it, you know, hitting the net, 
yeah, I get it, but uh, you're not going hit to hit the net all the time, guys. There's a lot of bodies out there. Guys block shots so much, it's really tough to get pucks through to the net in this NHL. But when the Canadians practice in Brossard, you'll see guys come out early with buckets of pucks and they're shooting all the time. I mean, it's not the, they shoot all the time. They shoot, you know, each player probably shoots 150 pucks every day in practice. So it's, I don't know if he's a shooting coach, but it's definitely something they work on. When I was the ringside reporter for the regional games, I got to watch all the games from the Zamboni hole. And that's when I was shocked about just how much, there's no room there. You know, that the game is so fast, the guys are so big. And as Chris was talking about the blocking shots, that there's no lane. So when, you know, you're watching up top from the press box or on TV, yes, it looks like they got tons of time and a lot of opportunity, but they really don't. So I think it's just a matter that the Canadians need to find a way to get more space out there, to get more time, to maybe just get a, a, a little bit more of a shooting lane available. And I just said everybody blocks shots now. I mean, these guys were these shot blocker protectors on mm -hmm. their skates. The equipment's better. There's less chance of being hurt. I mean, everybody's diving in front of shot, shots, and it is. It's hard to get the puck through the net. Okay. In the month and a half that um, Alexander Galchenyuk was injured, Philip Deneau was able to work his way up from the fourth line center to the first line center. He fit in comfortably on that line. He produced 12 points during that time span. He's now, he now looks to be just as comfortable centering the second line. Do you think that's sustainable? Is he good enough to hi hang on to his role as a second line center? Well, this is gonna go, could go down as Mark Bergevin's greatest trade. I mean, you got Dano from Chicago plus a second round pick for mm. Dale Weiss and Fleischman. Weiss is struggling in Philadelphia. Fleischman's not even playing in the NHL. Bergevin has always liked this kid. When the Blackhawks drafted him in the first round, Bergevin was part of the Blackhawks management team, and he's really just improved. I talked to him the other day after practice, and he said that he has more poise with the puck now. He said when you first come to the NHL, everything's so fast, and you don't think you have time, and then you realize that you probably have more time than you think you did, and he's realizing that. And I think I can see him as a second-line center. He's a pretty big guy. He can skate. Uh, he moves the puck, and I think as he gets more confidence, he's going to continue to play better. I mean, it would be good if they could get a, a, a better second-line center and a trade or something. I mean, a bigger name, but for now, I don't think you're losing much with him there. Yeah, I like where he is right now. Um, again, going from the fourth line to the first line, injuries, you know, next man up, time to play. And he's been put in situations, and he's been put with some pretty good players, uh, which helps him. But being put in those situations, like at first, it's going to be nerve-wracking. You're nervous. Uh, uh, you know, you want to do well. And and all of a sudden you get playing, you realize, you know, here I am playing hockey. This is what I do. And this kid definitely has the confidence now. Actually, it's, it's just pouring out of his ears. <laughs> and that's a good thing. And he could, he could very well uh, uh, hang on to that number two spot. Um, it, it should be interesting to see when DNA comes back and then McCarron at the end mm -hmm. of the season, is he coming back and who's going to play center, where, what, uh, Placanic, what happens at the trade deadline. But I really like what this kid has done here and uh, he's only going to get better. He's showing a lot of positive signs, but also, too, I think it's a little bit too early. He hasn't played a full year in the NHL yet. So have him play a full year, see what he's like, as Chris said, when you're not necessarily playing with top players either, how he rises to that challenge. So it's, it's good so far, but I'm not ready to say that, you know, that spot belongs to Philip Dano, that uh, we'll see if the adrenaline sometimes runs out. We see that a lot of times when players get called up and they're great for a bit and then not. So it's just a matter of seeing how the rest of the season plays out for him. Well, in the 18 games that Galchenyuk missed with his knee injury, Dano had 12 points playing with Pacioretty and, and Radulov. And he also scored what might be the goal of the year, that end-to-end -end <laughs> yeah. rush in Winnipeg. Looks like, uh, looked like something Guy Lafleur uh, used to do. But uh, as I said, if he's your, I think he's okay as a number two center, and if they find a better number two center, he's number three. He's a heck of a number three center if the Canadians go that route. How much of his success would you say can be attributed to his new haircut? <laughs> <laughs> I read your article this morning. I, I asked him about that, and he said, he says, I feel faster, I fly more without it. He was sort of joking, but uh, uh, yeah, he had that long hair hanging out from the nail. And he said, he says, I just wanted to look a little bit more professional, but I think his fiance had something to do with convincing him to get it cut also. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. how superstitious <laughs> hockey players are. As he wrote, he was afraid to cut his hair because then that would maybe uh, take down his game a little bit. But it's just, did you have any crazy superstitions? Samson and Delilah. Uh, I I, I always used to pee in the right urinal. The, <laughs> the left one and the right one, I always peed in the right one. I always put my right skate on first. That was it. That's our show for this week. Thanks for tuning in, Habs fans. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. As always, share and like the video. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and leave comments in the comment section below. I'm Adam Susser, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>